So here we are with Matt Norrie. Matt is going to show us all around cotton. So he's going to talk about all things cotton from the seed. And we're going to start with the seeds yep. and then go right the way through to the end. So Matt, tell us all things cotton. Right, well, you come with us. We're walking here a little bit. We've um, got some seed back here. So this is a bit of planting seed left over from the end of the season. So cotton's a crop where the seed you need to purchase each year. Um, because a cotton seed mm -hmm. comes out of a uh, comes out of cotton, and it's got little bits of fur on it. Yep. Um, and so it needs to go through a special delinting plant, and uh, comes out the other side with a um, a treatment on it. Oh. But, but that is your um, your uh, cotton seed. So the treatment makes it turns it blue. So the treatment um, on it is uh, the dye can turn it blue. We can turn it any colour we, we we want to. But um, there's a fungicide on the seed that protects the seedling from, from, uh, uh, from pests and, and disease. Um, but the most amazing thing about these seeds is that you can't actually see, see what I'm um, talking about, but it's what's in the seed. Yep. So on this bag here, we've got a couple of labels here. One that says Bolgard 3, yep. one that says Roundup Ready Flex. Now these are traits, okay. um, and they are, they are genes that are built into the plant. So uh, cotton used to get sprayed for insecticides uh, for insects a lot. Yep. Um, and Heliothus, um, Amidra, is, is one of the main pests. Um, and so th what this technology is, it's a, it's a, it's a genetically modified um, trait, which, is, um, which was developed by Monsanto, which is now Bayer. But essentially what it is, is it's a, a naturally occurring protein, which um, becomes present in the plant and it's toxic to the pests. So where we used to spray to, to try and kill these insects, um, we were spraying up to, in the late 90s, up to sort of 10 times a season. Wow. We're now cut our insecticide use by 90 odd percent. So we just basically don't spray for Heliothus anymore. We're only, there's a few little pests where we spray a couple of times. Um, but uh, the other cool thing about these seeds is the Roundup Ready Flex component. So instead of uh, using uh, a lot of um, uh, residual herbicides mm -hmm. and uh, manual chipping of the, of, of the weeds. Yep. Um, we can now just spray Roundup over the top of the cotton plants, the weeds die, oh. and the cotton grows on through. So Roundup doesn't kill the cotton? No. Wow. Okay. Um, but it kills all the rest of the weeds. Yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, it's a very efficient way of doing it, um, and it's a very cheap way of doing it. The cotton chip is the job. Well, it has, but the yeah. thing, I, I guess probably the, the Roundup Ready turned up in time because even a lot of farmers around the district, we can't even find people to drive yeah. tractors, yeah. Let, let alone people to swing a hoe. Yeah, yeah. Um, in the heat of the day. Yeah. Hard yeah. work. And um, so it's kind of a, a, um, a, a practice of, of the old. Um, yep. Sometimes we get chippers to clean up a few little bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. There's still a handful of them around, but. Um, yeah, it's kind of interesting how this trade has actually changed the social dynamic of the town a little bit, where we used to get teams of chippers just landing in the cotton growing areas. Yep. You'd have hundreds of casual workers arrive um, over the summer and they'd go out and chip in the morning and um, return to the caravan parks and their accommodation in the afternoon. So there's a stack of people that used to come into the town, but um, yeah, we can't, even if we wanted to, we couldn't source them anymore. Yeah, right. Um, All right, so now we're... I've never seen a cotton plant this close, but I've driven past millions of them. Never yep. stopped to look at them. Yep. <laughs> so this is still a couple of months off. Um, so how do you take care of them? How do you keep them all looking so good? Right. So it all starts at, at, the, uh, at the very start with, with the ground preparation. And so that begins, uh, it actually begins, begins um, about 12 months ago from this point now. So the ground is, uh, generally comes out of a, uh, out of a fallow crop. Yep. Um, so either wheat crop or a um, or a sorghum crop in uh, in rotation. Right. Um, that's all ploughed back into the earth. Yep. Um, the, uh, the, the 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 paddock is um, pulled into one metre hills, um, and the hills are very important because that's what allows us to be able to irrigate the field from one end to the other. Um, the fertiliser is generally applied um, around September, and. Uh, Planting generally occurs within the second or third week of October. So that's when the uh, little seed goes into the ground. Yep. And it comes out as a little two leaf plant, comes out with two little cotyledons. Um, and then from there, it uh, puts out first two, three, four leaves and starts to put some, uh, put some uh, what we call nodes yep. on the plant and, uh, and it grows. You can see these flowers on here. Yep. 
these these flowers generally uh, occur start to see them around Christmas time between Christmas and New Year and um, it, it's, it's the start of where the cotton actually comes from so the cycle of of the um, reproduction system of a cotton plant is that it starts out as a what we call a square and then the funny thing about squares is that they don't look very square they actually look more triangle yeah. <laughs> well, out of the square emerges a flower yeah so this flower stays white for about two or three days and then mm. it turns purple and then underneath the flower we can find a more mature one when you take the top off the flower you can just see start to see uh, uh, yeah right the start of a cotton bowl developing yep and so those cotton bowls over about a 40 50 day period they grow into that ah uh, right and then once they're mature which this one is not once they're mature that's the cotton inside. Yeah, right. So this cotton here is still developing and maturing. Yep. Um, but once the once the fibres and the seeds inside are mature, the bowl naturally splits open. Dries and cracks. Yep. Yep. And these bracts here peel all the way back. Yep. And you end up with a um, with a white, fluffy, like bowl. a cotton bud, cotton ball type thing. Yeah. 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 We call them bowls. B o double l's. Bowl. Um, is a, is and once that's open, yep, um, that job is done. Um, so then it's a case of then waiting for the rest of his mates to finish growing, yep, and maturing. Um, and then when we get close to harvest, we use a defoliant, um, which takes the last of the of the leaves off the plant. Yep. Um, once all the leaves are dropped off and all the bowls are open, it's time for harvest. So for the early ones that, that open and dry, dry and open, yep. if it rains, does that damage them? Yeah, so rain can have a, uh, an impact on quality. Um, it's like all commodities, it's, um, it's bought and sold on a particular type of, of quality. Yep. Um, luckily in Australia, we've got an amazing breeding team that breeds some of the best cotton germplasm in the world. So both for yield and, and quality. Right. Um, so that's why Australian cotton is very, very sought after in the in the international marketplace, because the length and the strength and the thickness of the fibre is generally far superior yep. to a lot of the other cottons on the international market. Right. So all the cotton Australia produces every year has a has a home. It's always sold. Yeah. Um, the spinning mills, um, uh, generally uh, in China, India, um, Indonesia. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're, they're generally made um, to, to process a certain type of, of, uh, of cotton, like a, a certain grade. Yep. And a lot of Australian cotton either goes into premium products, um, like jeans and shirts and sheets, um, and, and, that's, and that sort of thing where you want a really nice, yep. smooth feeling cotton. Yep. Um, a lot of the, your, your, your cheaper or your lesser quality type of cottons with a shorter fibre length, generally go into towels and um, ah, right. denim and that sort of thing. Yeah, right. Um, so it's a bit like silk, like the 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 longer and stronger you can make the fibre, the better quality product you, you can spin out of it. And so the spinning mills are designed to take a certain type of um, quality of cotton. And so actually a lot of Australian cotton gets blended with lesser types of cotton yeah. to actually make the type of yarn yeah. that the um, spinning mills are, are actually looking for. Yeah. The incredible thing about the, the varieties that they breed over there is that how adaptable they are to such a broad range of climatic conditions that we've got in Australia. Yeah. So we've now got cotton growing from all the way up at Kununurra in the north, yep. um, all down through parts of Queensland, New South Wales, and there's even uh, cotton right down on the New South Wales Victorian border. Oh, way down there, it's colder. It is. Yeah, wow. It is, but the varieties mm -hmm. that, um, that, that have been developed um, have proven to be very ad adaptable to, no matter where we where, where we grow it. Yep. Uh, so practices have become so much more efficient, much better for well, workers. The crop itself is far superior. Yep. This, and that's just coming from research yeah, very and breeding. Much. Research and breeding right over there. Wow. All happens here in Narrabri. Narrabri. Who would have thought? It's the centre. Centre of the universe. Centre of agriculture. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, wow. It is. Um, awesome. actually do use a growth regulant to, um, to make the crop stay somewhat shorter. 
Yep. And that it also focuses the plant's energy and putting it into, into reproduction yeah. rather than putting it into biomass. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so we can manipulate the, the cotton plant to stay smaller, use less of its moisture on, on, on leaf area and, and height, yep. and try and focus that energy into actually producing bulbs. So we've had a wet, wet sort of last year or two has been lots of rain, lots of yep. going back six or seven years ago in that big dry. What was that like out here then? Uh, yeah, that um, 2016 to 2019 period was very dry. Mm -hmm. We didn't grow much in the way of dryland cotton, didn't grow much in the way of dryland crops. Um, 16 was a bit of a wet year, so we actually ended up with a little bit of water in the dam yep. um, upstream. And so that 16, 17 crop we could grow some, but then the subsequent years, our level of access to water dropped off quite significantly because it's simply not available. Yeah. Uh, there's no water to be allocated um, to our accounts if it doesn't flow into the dam. Yeah. So we just quite simply cut our acres back and just didn't grow as, as much. much. Um, but now it's rained, um, allocations are, are back. Yeah. The rivers are full. Um, every single wetland on the east coast of Australia has had a has had a wonderful drink. Yeah. Um, critically important for um, riparian uh, health along the river, bird breeding events, mm. fish. Um, all of those things are, are, um, are critical to maintaining a healthy ecosystem. Yeah. So we've had three wonderful years of, of uh, above average rainfall. Um, but as nature goes, it comes and goes in cycles. Mm. So we're now starting to prepare ourselves for probably going back into a dry cycle. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what that means for us um, is that uh, we, we still have um, allocation up in the dam mm -hmm. and uh, being able to store that water in that dam and carry that allocation over yep. means that we'll have water for the following year yep. Yep. and even in worst case scenario there might be a little bit for the year after. Yeah. Okay. Um, but the allocation priorities um, for the way that water is um, allocated is your uh, critical human needs always come first mm. and then your um, storage losses um, along with your, your environmental allocation that's to make, make, make sure that there's a base flow mm. in the river yep. um, for as long as possible um, and then high security uh, licenses are filled first there's not many of those in this particular system um, and last of all um, if there's any water left over after that it gets allocated to general security um, so we're yeah. the we're the um, we're the last to actually receive an allocation mm. yeah uh, the way that, the way that the system works um, yeah, and water is a bit of a sensitive topic for cotton as well. Yeah, <laughs> it's perceived to be a, a very, a very thirsty crop. Um, but I guess the the crop itself is an allocated water. Mm. Um, a farmer uh, holds irrigation licences, yep. um, which uh, which you can um, uh, generally purchase with the with the property, um, and they're not they're not cheap. Um, yeah, and those licences um, only get water allocated to them when there's something. When there is water. When, when there is water. Yeah. Um, and for and for yeah, for, I think we, we we went nearly four years without getting any allocation. Yeah, um, wow. So when we do get an allocation, it's important that we get the most out of that every megalitre of water, not just for us, um, but the dollar return per meg also has on flow. Um, uh, benefits to the community as well. Mm. So we've yeah. almost got a social responsibility not to not to waste it. Yeah, um, right. because the the um, economic activity that's generated from growing um, the crop that can provide the best dollar return per megalitre mm. um, is the best for um, the farmer, the employees, the, yeah, the town, yeah, the community, and yeah. it just, and it just all flow on. It all flows through. Like all all, all of our suppliers, um, you know, like we. This is intensive crop. We use fuel, fertilizer, um, uh, you know, um, a, a lot of machinery, yep. um, mechanics, um, agronomists. Uh, there's a whole, the whole community that goes into yeah, um, and growing it, like, yeah, and caring for it, and yeah, getting it to where it is. Yeah. So Matt, just tell us. This is the, the part of the irrigation thing. Just tell us briefly how that works. Look, it's actually really simple. Um, we just uh, use use pumps to fill these channels. And then uh, it's just using gravity, these siphons um, just take water from one side of the channel to the other. You can see we've got little, uh, what we call rotor bucks um, between the channel and the crop. Um, this area here where there is no crop allows the planters and the cultivators and spray rigs to be able to turn out of a row and back into a row. Yep. Um, and then when the rotor bucks are in place, it then directs the water down the correct row. 
And so that's how we get an even distribution of water across the field. Yep. So as long as the water in the channel is higher than the ground on this side. Ah, oh, yeah, that's right. Yep. You, you can go to the flow. Oh, you should do the little pump, yep. And that's it. You've done See? that once or twice in your life? <laughs> I'd like a dollar for each time I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, a typical day um, irrigating, I'll start, I don't know, three, four hundred. There's, there's an open bowl. He would have only opened in the last sort of 48, 72 hours. That's funny because there's, there's four parts to the, the, the outside of it, but there's five parts on the inside. Is that right? So this bowl here, he's actually got five locks. Oh, so it's unusual. Well, sometimes they, sometimes they, they um, put on five lock bowls, some, mostly four, sometimes three. Ah, right, there you go. Um, I don't know how or why or what determines what, a, what makes it a four or a five lock bowl. Yeah. But generally your first position is more likely to be a five lock bowl. And so that one's actually got more cotton in him than that one. Yeah, yeah, true, it's a lot thicker, isn't it? Yeah. Bulkier. Yep. It's so soft, it's silky. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, wow. Yeah, and uh, if, if you squeeze it a little bit, like stick your fingers down the middle and squeeze it, you'll fill a few hard bits in there. Oh yeah? That's the seed. Ah, right. So the seed is um, embedded. In... Um, so these are old, probably now antiquated machines. Wow. Um, so you probably see on the sides of the road those great big mm. yellow. So I'd say 98% of the Australian cotton crop is now harvested by um, automated round bale cotton pickers. Yeah. Um, we're still running the old conventional system. Um, the, the new style picker came out in about 2007, 2008. Um, but we're not a, a, a large family farm. We're probably a smaller um, right. than average farm. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, those round bale machines are pretty expensive. They're mm. pretty heavy. Um, and these pickers that we have, um, we made a decision about 10 years not to invest in a round bale. Yeah. And we thought we'd uh, run these old girls out to their um, useful, end of useful life. Yeah. Um, and they're still going. Wow. Um, so these, these are about 25 years old now. Um, oh, really? Yeah. And they don't look that old. How much would one of these have been back then, ish? Oh, so one of these new was about, uh, this one here we bought new, this number one. Um, from memory, and I was still in school, um, I think it was about 250 to $300,000 at the time. Wow. Um, to buy one of the new round bale machines today, mm -hmm about 1.7 million dollars. Wow. Uh, but basically the way they work is the, 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 the cotton that's, that's ready and ripe, it, um, you drive the machine through the field, the cotton gets fed in between these two grey feeders here. Yep. And you can see the spindles. Um, yep. So basically what they're doing is that they are turning that direction. These spindles, if you feel them here, they've got some very sharp little barbs on them. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> you go the wrong way, they're sharp. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and basically what they do is that they grab the cotton out of the bowl uh, and they wrap the cotton around the spindle. Yep. Um, these heads are all pulled apart at the moment, but you end up with all the cotton wrapped around these spindles. These spindles are going really fast. These, the bars that the spindles are on, they move around as well at a speed that you can't actually see them when everything's going flat out. Wow. Um, and so everything's wound up on the spindles. Yep. And then to unwind everything, what sits behind here is what we call a doffer column. And it's basically um, a column with 18 pads on it with little, with little, um, uh, little rubber teeth on them. Oh, yeah. And they actually unwrap the cotton off the spindle. Oh, yeah, right. And all of this happens um, within a, a fraction of a second. Um, once the cotton is unwrapped off, off the spindle, it then falls into this chute back here. Behind the uh, cab here of, of the picker, there's two really big fans and they blow air yep. to the front of the machine. Um, that air gets delivered just behind the chute there, creates a venturi, and in this section here, th there's now a vacuum. Ah, right. And so, and so once the cotton gets plucked off the spindle, falls into, into that cavity there, yep. and it just gets sucked out of there and then blown up into the basket. 
Wacky do. Uh, once it's in the basket, we're, we're in control. So that's all things cotton. We asked Matt for half an hour and he gave us so much more. We learned so much about cotton and how farmers are working to be sustainable for both the environment and the community. Thanks heaps, mate. We don't know where we're spending our time next, but we know we want to spend those minutes with mates.